Welcome to the Prophecy Club. I'm going to continue telling you about my story, my testimony. You know, kind of funny. 21 years been on radio, and I think this first time I've actually told my testimony. And the reason I'm doing this is because I'm going to be telling you some very important things. You need to know that it's not me doing this, it's not my message, it's God's message. And so I think it's important for you to know who I am and the fact that God has called me to do what I do, what my idea, and I've told you part of that story. As a matter of fact, I told you how I got called in to studying Bible prophecy by someone handing me an audio tape called The Buzzards Are Coming. I told you how I wrote up a two or three page article about how America is the mystery Babylon, and that started a Bible study. I told you how I got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I told you how I got the second prophecy that said that I would be a soul winner, a fisher of men, save thousands upon thousands. I told you how I met Demetri Dudeman and some amazing miracles that took place there. However, today I want to talk to you about how I met Henry Groover. Now, at the time I was living in Omaha, and of course, we invited uh, Demetri Dudeman in to speak, and I was getting involved with the full gospel businessmen there also, as I had done in Lawrence, Kansas, and Topeka, Kansas. And I had kind of become, you know, a guy that was known for being able to get speakers to come in and to speak. Now, again, I, I had no idea that this is going to lead to something a whole lot bigger. I just wanted to know, just like you want to know, okay? Uh, Again, there's nothing special here. As a matter of fact, I thought of an analogy. This is how you can know who I am. I remember when I was a young uh, boy, I remember seeing a lady on TV that had a sock, and she had sewed two little eye slits and a mouth slit on the end of this sock, and she put her hand up in the sock, and she began to talk about it, and she called the little puppet Lamb Chops. I can't remember the lady's name, but I remember the name of the puppet was called Lamb Chops, and with her fingers, she would act like this lamb was talking to you. And I thought, that's exactly me, because it's like I'm the sock, and the hand inside the sock is God. Okay, and that's the way it is with every servant of the Lord. Everyone that has been sent into his vineyard, (laughs) we can do nothing unless we abide in the vine. We can do nothing on our own. It is only the hand inside us, that God hand, that presence, that spirit of God inside us that does this. So I want to be right up front with you. I'm nothing special. I'm just a sock. (laughs) What's special is the spirit of God that's in me that is bringing this to you. This is God bringing this information to you. Now, how did I meet Henry Groover? Well, Once again, I was at a full gospel businessman meeting, and someone handed me a tape and said, hey, I think this guy's really good. We ought to invite him to be a speaker at the full gospel businessman. So I listened to the tape, and this is what I heard on the tape. The name of this particular vision I call I Saw Submarines Attack America by Henry Groover of Joyful Sound Ministries. He says, I was in Wales December 14th, 1986. And this was, by the way, about 1988 when I had the opportunity to meet Henry Groover. So December 14th, 1986, he says, I was on top of the Eagle Tower in the Carnarvon Castle. It had eight points on it. Each of the points were eroded eagles. This castle was built in the 12th century. By the way, I typed this up from him giving this talk in the full gospel businessman meeting when he was there. He said, I was overlooking the Irish Sea towards the North Sea, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, tip of Scotland, Greenland, Iceland, up in that area. All of a sudden, I was lifted up above the earth. I was looking down upon the earth like a globe. As I looked down on the earth, I saw all of these massive amounts of all kinds of ships and airplanes. They were coming above Norway out of this inlet. They headed down between the United States and Europe. They literally covered the whole Atlantic. Then I wanted to see what was happening to the United States. I looked over on the globe at the United States, and I saw coming out of the United States these radio communication towers. I saw the jagged lines like they draw to show that communications are coming out. All of a sudden, as I was looking down on them, 
that began to sprinkle down on the earth like dust. And I thought, oh, no. Oh, no. They, they're not getting through. They're not getting through. They, they, they don't know what is happening. They're totally oblivious. Then I saw all of these submarines emerging from under the surface. I was surprised at how close they were to our borders. They were in our territorial waters. They were almost parked on our beaches. Then I saw missiles come out. They hit eastern coastal cities of the United States. Then I looked across the country, where my family was living in the northwest, and I saw the submarines emerge. I saw missiles come out and hit western coastal cities. I cried out, and I said, Oh God, oh God, when will this be, and what will be the sign of its coming? I heard an audible voice speak from behind me and say, When Russia opens her doors and lets the masses go, the free world will occupy themselves with transporting, housing, feeding, and caring for the masses, and will let down their weapons and cry peace and safety. Then sudden destruction will come. Then is when it will come. Again, that was December 14th, 1986. Glasnost and Perestroika were unheard of at that time. Now, me getting this audio tape, <laughs> I'm beginning to think, man, is the, all of America filled with these guys <laughs> running around saying that America is going to get bombed by the Russians? Now, understand, some 21 years later, still to this day, Dmitry Dudeman and Henry Groover have had the most important information that I've received. Now, we've had, what, 154 speakers make 305 DVDs? So I think that's saying something. Now, it was not me. You see, God was preparing me. I guess he saw in my heart a guy that was stupid enough to just believe the truth when he heard it, and how should we say, brave enough or idiot enough, however you want to say that, to just stand up and tell people the simple truth. <laughs> and you'd think that telling people the simple truth wouldn't be that difficult. But I'll tell you what, based upon how few people do it these days, it must be near impossible. <laughs> okay. Shortly after that, I had another audio tape handed to me. <laughs> and this one was handed to me by Henry Groover. He began to tell me about this other man by the name of Ron Wyatt. He told us that he was walking and praying in Israel, and he had prayed and asked the Lord when he got done with his walking and praying over cities. That's what Henry did. He would walk over, matter of fact, he walked over 500 cities, now probably a couple of thousand. But anyway, he gets a map and systematically walks down every street in the city, praying loud, praying in the Spirit, pulling down strongholds, loosen the angels to do warfare. When he's finished praying over the city, he goes to a high point over the city, raises his hands, and prays for the city and reclaims the city for God. He says many times, most of the time, he will see revival break out in that city shortly after that. He said while he was walking and praying, he said, Lord, I'm just about done with my job today. And I would like to see some wonderful sights, some of your miracles, some of your wonderful places here in Israel, if you don't mind. You know, we've got a little bit extra time before I have to catch my flight back to America. And God arranged an hour or so later for him to supernaturally meet Ron Wyatt. Ron Wyatt is a self, I would say God-called, biblical archaeologist. And through the hand of God, and through God touching Ron's heart, and basically giving Henry a personal guided tour to see some amazing things that God has shown Ron White, a biblical archaeologist. Now, to get to some of the things that we saw you see, shortly after that, we invited Ron Wyatt in to speak at Full Gospel Businessman, and he was amazing. Then shortly after that, Leslie and I received a letter in the mail that said, we're getting up a tour to actually go see some of these places. <laughs> I can remember that day I saw this letter, and it was telling about all of these wonderful places 
over a two-week period that we were going to go see. And as I recall, the price was like $1,500. This was in 1991. And in 1991, $1,500 was a whole lot more than it is today. It seemed like a mountain to us. Well, as soon as I saw this, I thought, <laughs> doesn't make a difference what it's going to cost. Somehow I'm going to find the money. I am going to this. So I walked into the bathroom. Leslie was putting on her face. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I said, honey, I'm going. I don't know how we're going to get the money, but I'm going. She took one look at it and laid the papers back down and said, I'm going too. And I said, well, honey, I, I don't even know how we're going to find the money for me to go, much less you to go. She said, I'm going. If you're going, I'm going. Well, that turned out to be wonderful. Now, let me tell you, I was in at the time, again, I was selling these courses on public speaking, human relations, building self-confidence, overcoming fear, uh, also a sales course, a management course, customer relations, uh, all, all those sort of courses I would call mostly on businesses and I would talk with the business about having some of their employees in a course and then I would turn around and teach the course. Well, would you believe that God arranged for me to get a great big sale and the commission covered me and Leslie to go. I remember <laughs> I remember uh, later that year we had a meeting and they pulled out all of the uh, reports for that particular year. And the boss said, well, now, you know, you, you did real good this year. You hit the 250 mark. You're in the 250 club. That was a big deal. Uh, you got a, a lapel pin if you enrolled at least 250 people. And, and I did. I was among the top people. Again, it was all God. It wasn't me. But anyway, he said, now, just think, if you had worked those two weeks instead of taking off, you could have sold even more and you wouldn't have that flat spot in your sales. Well, <laughs> I knew that there wasn't a flat spot because God had arranged for extra sales to come in. So our finances were all covered. And I said, what flat spot? We'll be right back after this message. In 1980, an angel came to Dimitri Dudeman and told him that it is written in the Bible and that America will be defeated in one hour by Russia. I just made a brand new DVD covering all of the secular real life proof that Russia really is preparing to do exactly that. Topics are Arise, Devour Much Flesh, Russia and Prophecy, Russia Now Rich and Strong, Russia's Numerous Military Expansions, Ukraine and How It Is Making the Bear Angry. Russia is warning the U.S., but we're not listening. Russia is building their military, modernizing submarines, aircraft, missiles, and their army while the U.S. is downsizing and filled with traitors and weaknesses. Two and a half hours, gift of $30, go to prophecyclub.com or call 785-266-1112. That's The Russian Bear Rises at prophecyclub.com or 785-266-1112. Order today. And now, back to the program. Our finances were all covered, and I said, what flat spot? So he picked up the papers and he said, well, right, right, well, uh, so I guess there wasn't a flat spot. And I said, no, there wasn't a flat spot. In other words, God made up not only the money for us to go, but also the numbers so that my sales, everything, it didn't hurt at all. God provided for us to go. Okay, now, now when we got over there, let me tell you about this two-week tour. Because I believe that God has told me, and this is the reason I'm giving you my story, eventually I'm going to tell you that God has shown me that I will be speaking in sports stadiums. Nah, not necessarily mean, but I mean, we're going to have guests. We're going to have meetings in sports stadiums. I mean, it's going to be like a Billy Graham revival. He's shown me that, you know, I'll tell you about that vision. And the question will be, how can we get unbelievers to believe that the Bible is real? I believe God sent Leslie and I on this tour so we could see archaeological evidence that proves the Bible. As a matter of fact, we have a video. It was the very first video we ever offered at the Prophecy Club, and it's called Archaeology Confirms the Bible. You can order it either in VHS or in DVD at the Prophecy Club. 
and it is the videotape I shot in 1991 when Leslie and I went to <laughs> to Israel and to Turkey and uh, uh, Egypt and all these places I'm about to tell you about. Now, here's what happened. On this two-week tour, let me tell you some of the areas that we saw. And we saw a lot of areas, but I'm only going to talk about the ones that biblically uh, the Bible is proven, okay? the archaeological evidence. First of all, the biggest thing that I think we saw was Noah's Ark. <laughs> yeah, I've been there. It's in Turkey. And by the way, it's located in what used to be called the Valley of the Eight. <laughs> Why do they call it the Valley of the Eight? Well, that's remembering the eight people that survived the flood on the ark. And it's located just outside of a city that used to be called the City of the Eight. Today it's called Debayazit, Debayazit, Turkey. And I've got a <laughs> I've got a funny story there. I don't know if this would be real appropriate for radio, but I will go ahead and take a chance. We were driving from a large city out to Debayazit, and it's about a six-hour drive over nothing but just barren area and no other cities. And as we're driving along, about halfway, people start complaining, hey, you know, I need a bathroom break. <laughs> well, uh, we just happened to be sitting at the front of the bus, and so when the bus finally pulled up to the bathroom place, I just happened to be the first one off, and I walked into the little concrete pillbox is what it looked like. You could barely stand up in it. In other words, it was designed for the short people around there, not your taller Americans. And I walked in and there was a hole. Fortunately, I didn't have to do the serious business. <laughs> but as I was doing my business, I looked over and there's a Folgers coffee can there. And there's a little spigot with water slowly dripping into this Folgers coffee can. And I'm sitting here, and I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking, what? What, 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 what is that? What, why do they have that here? I looked around, and then I saw that there was no toilet paper in the place. So I walked out, and a couple of the Turkish guys there, I said, this coffee can in there, what's that for? <laughs> and they reached back as if they were getting their billfold out of their hip, and they pulled their hand up and they rubbed their fingers together as if to say that was their toilet paper. And, of course, <laughs> I tell that story and people go, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I'm just telling you this story is real. I've been there. I've done that. Some very interesting things that happened. Okay, so now we get over to Noah's Ark. Leslie and I, we walked all over it. We saw the place where Ron told the story of how he drilled into the side of it with his core drill, and it hit a brass bar. I, yes, I said that right, brass bar. He said it did some terrible things to his core drill and him out on the end of it there. <laughs> and he said he found some animal droppings and some petrified, of course, and some petrified animal hair. He said they were red. I mean, just as red as could be. Well, he also explained how they had done all of these subsurface interface radar, and he was able to show that this was Noah's Ark. It had various caverns or uh, basically empty spaces in it even today. He explained how it was originally up higher on the mountain, but the water had kind of washed it down, and, to, and it would have been all broken up and just down the hill. But it, God arranged for it to hit this rock, and it kind of like nailed it to the side of the mountain. And, of course, you have to ask yourself, what? <laughs> how do you get a boat the size of a World War II aircraft carrier, 6,200 feet above sea level, up on the side of a mountain where there are no trees for hours and hours in all directions, okay? How do you get a boat up there? We saw, for example, we were walking along with some friends of ours that I had invited from church to go, and they looked down, and they said, wow, what's this? Picked it up, man. Of course, today, that is the famous rivet. And, of course, the way the Noah's Ark was constructed is it was made out of gopher wood overlaid with iron. 
And <laughs> you might say, well, what is gopher wood? Well, there is no such thing as gopher wood. But that's what the Bible says. Well, we do a little bit of research, we find out that what it was is plywood. In other words, it was wood this way and then grain that way, overlaid with more wood this way and that way and this way, just like plywood. Then they would put this iron, like about an inch thick, about an inch uh, or, or two inches of wood with about an inch of this iron. They would drill a hole through it. They'd put a rivet, and then they riveted it together. I mean, it, it was riveted together. Well, we found one of those rivets. It's amazing. We saw the evidence archaeologically that that really is really is Noah's Ark. Now, <laughs> funny part is the only ones who don't know that oh, Noah's Ark is there is the dumb Americans. <laughs> because when you go to Turkey, you drive down the road, there's big signs that says Noah's Ark, 20 miles. Noah's Ark, 10 miles. Noah's Ark, turn here. <laughs> you go up there, there's a visitor center. Everybody in Turkey knows that's Noah's Ark. But us dumb Americans, we go to some movie and they tell us it's up on the snow. Well, first of all, it can't be on Ararat because Ararat is so high, it gets so much snow and ice every year that it has cleaned off that mountain centuries ago. If there was a Noah's Ark up there, it's gone now. Nothing survives on Mount Ararat. The Bible says it's actually located in one of the lower sister mountains, and the Bible says it's located in the mountains, plural, of Uratu. That would be like saying in the Rocky Mountains, okay, uh, which is a big mountain range, okay, and so is the mountains of Uratu or the Ararat Mountains. Yes, there is one big mountain called Ararat, but there's a whole range of mountains, and this was located on one of the lower sister mountains. Now, there's a whole lot more I can say about Noah's Ark, but let's move on to the next thing I saw over there. The evening after we had seen Noah's Ark, we all sat down for a meal. Ron White began to pull out pictures. He showed us a picture of a giant's thumb bone. Now, on me, that thumb between, you know, your first knuckle and the second knuckle on your thumb, on me, that's probably an inch and a quarter, maybe an inch and a half long. But this one measured three and three quarter inches long. And he talked to us a lot about giants and things like that. The next day, he took us to show us other amazing things throughout Israel. For example, he took us to what is known in Israel as Gordon's Calvary. And we saw the real place and the archaeological evidence to why he believes truly this was where Jesus was crucified and buried. He told us that with his subsurface interface radar, he found a round stone about 10 feet down just outside the door of where Jesus was born. It was round. It measured 12 foot, 2 inches by 18 inches, and he believed that to be the door that would cover. You remember the, the Bible says that, that the angel rolled the door away, okay? This all fits the biblical account, and he sat down and he began, began to explain all of this. Then, of course, every time Ron would talk, I was running the VHS camera, brand new one at the time, using the best VHS tape that I could get. I was running that stuck under his nose, recording everything he said. Well, we sat down, and he began to tell us how he found all of the details of how he found the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, I mean the gold box that had the Ten Commandments in it. He said that he found it, if I'm remembering right, it was like May 2nd, 1982. He tells about how he was walking along this escarpment, whatever that is, okay? I mean, he said a lot of words we didn't exactly understand. He said one day I was walking along this escarpment with an Israeli archaeological friend of mine, and he said all of a sudden my hand pointed out, just, just jutted out and pointed and said, that's Jeremiah's grotto, and the Ark of the Covenant is in there. And, of course, the guy said, well, that's wonderful. We'll pay your expenses. You know, you dig for it, blah, blah, blah. Well, he couldn't at the time, but he came back. Make a long story short, when he did finally break in and finally found it, uh, some amazing, amazing, amazing stories took place. Now, unfortunately, our time has run out for today. Perhaps I can pick up with that in tomorrow's broadcast and tell you more about how the Ark of the Covenant was found. But for right now, let me go ahead and tell you a couple of other things we saw on this tour, and we'll pick up with the Ark of the Covenant tomorrow. 
We were also taken to the exit side of the Red Sea, and Ron showed us a granite pillar that he believed that was located there by Solomon. He found words like the crossing, the Red Sea, and the words that made him feel like this was probably erected by Solomon to commemorate the crossing of the Red Sea. Then down the road, he took us to a place that he thought to be Kadesh Barnea, which is the place where Moses struck the rock twice and water poured out of the rock. But now let me just tell you, that rock was a huge mountain. Well, I shouldn't say. Probably took, oh, 10, 15, 20 minutes to climb this mountain, but it was a big rock, okay? And there was a large hole in the side of it, and you could see how large amounts of water had just poured out of this round hole up there and rolled down the side of the mountain, making all of the rocks nice and smooth and polished. And you could see that massive amounts of water had poured out of this hole for a long time. Then he took us over just a little bit from there and showed us how this probably was where this water, the children of Israel in the desert, also he showed us probably where Korah, Datham, and Abiram had their little rebellion and how the earth opened up and swallowed them, their wives, their children, their animals, and everything, those people that rebelled against Moses. Then he took us to what we believe is the city of Gomorrah. We got to walk around. Leslie and I got back on the bus with a handful of brimstone. Brimstone were sulfur balls ranging from marble size, or I should say dime size, up to 50 cent size, and it covered the city. Matter of fact, I remember there's one place I was walking over, and it was like, whoa, what was that? Because all of a sudden, you could tell where you were walking was not solid ground. It was like hollow underneath because the whole city was just covered with these sticky sulfur balls. And when they stick to something, they burn at over 6,000 degrees. He took a stainless steel spoon while we we're there, put one of the sulfur balls on the spoon and lit it, and it burned through the stainless steel spoon. They estimated, can't even tell how hot it burns, burns so hot it burns up their equipment to try to measure it, but they estimate it to be over 6,000 degrees. So we had the chance to walk all over the city of Gomorrah and pick up handfuls of these sulfur balls. Now, I came back with five or six videotapes of the trip, which I edited into what would later be the first VHS tape the Prophecy Club would offer some three years later, which, by the way, you can get through the Prophecy Club. It's called Archaeology Confirms the Bible. And I prayed and I said, Lord, if you want me to show this, these things you've showed me to people, have them call me. And I won't ask how far I have to go. I won't ask for any offering or how much. None of that. They call, I go, period. Phone started ringing. Leslie and I went to about 25 different churches and Christian groups and organizations showing this tape of our trip with Ron Wyatt and archaeological evidence that confirms the Bible. Then one day, the Lord spoke to my heart saying, no more people will call. And sure enough, not one more person called. Now I know that that was a test. It was a test to see if Leslie and I would be faithful to serve his people, not trying to make money, not complaining it was too far to go. Shortly after that, a radio station manager called and asked me to start a radio program on Bible prophecy, and that's how Prophecy Club got started. We'll continue there and also with the Ark of the Covenant in tomorrow's broadcast. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your prayers, and thank you for your gifts of support. God bless. Now from the Prophecy Club, some exciting opportunities for you. In 1980, an angel came to Dimitri Dudeman and told him that it is written in the Bible and that America will be defeated in one hour by Russia. I just made a brand new DVD covering all of the secular real-life proof that Russia really is preparing to do exactly that. Topics are Arise, Devour Much Flesh, Russia and Prophecy, Russia Now Rich and Strong, Russia's Numerous Military Expansions, Ukraine and How It Is Making the Bear Angry, Russia is Warning the U.S., but we're not listening. 
Russia is building their military, modernizing submarines, aircraft, missiles, and their army, while the U.S. is downsizing and filled with traitors and weaknesses. Two and a half hours, gift of $30, go to prophecyclub.com or call 785-266-1112. That's The Russian Bear Rises at prophecyclub.com or 785-266-1112. Order today.